This is the Mercedes McLaren SLR. It's an exotic car that came out around the same time as the Ferrari Enzo and the Porsche Carrera GT in the mid 2000s. Back then, the Enzo started at $650,000. The Carrera GT was around $400,000 and these started at $450,000. And by the time production ended in 2009, they were selling for $500,000. But while the Enzo is now worth millions and the Carrera GTs have basically doubled in value, these things never really shot up. In fact, a search of auto trader shows me that the average asking price for an SLR right now is somewhere between $300,000 and $400,000. So today I've borrowed this SLR from a viewer here in Nashville, Tennessee to show you why I think this car is rather underappreciated. Before I get started, a brief overview. The SLR was made from 2003 to 2010 as a joint venture between Mercedes and McLaren. And, little known fact, despite the Mercedes badge, it wasn't made in Germany, but rather in McLaren's factory in the UK. It uses a supercharged V8 that makes 617 horsepower and 580 pound-feet of torque, mated to a five-speed automatic transmission. It'll do zero to 60 in three and a half seconds, and it tops out at an amazing 207 miles per hour. So the SLR seems pretty cool on paper, and of course it's also filled with a lot of interesting quirks and cool features. Today I'm going to show them to you, and then I'm going to take this SLR out on the road and find out how a half million dollar supercar drives. And of course for more of my thoughts on the SLR experience, click the link below to check out my column on autotrader.com oversteer. Now we'll start with one of the SLR's signature features, its doors. There's no immediately visible door handle here, but if you want to open it, just walk up, push this, and then door just opens right up for you. Now once you're inside, you may be wondering exactly how you close the door. Well, there's no button that automatically lowers the door. Instead, you just pull the handle, which is actually not that hard to reach. And then the door's closed. Maybe even more interesting is what happens when you're inside the car and you're trying to get out. Now, you'll notice if you look all up and down the door panel, there's no door handle anywhere. It's not anywhere on the door panel. So where is it? It's actually on the floor next to your legs when you're sitting down next to the seat. It looks just like a normal door handle. Pull it and the door opens right up and you can get out. Now, speaking of things opening, let's talk about one of my favorite features of the SLR, the hood. I've always loved this hood. It is massive. It is flat. It is giant. You can land a helicopter on this thing, but how do you open it? Well, that's a quirk in and of itself. Uh, to start the process, you pull a little red lever underneath the steering column, like in most cars. But the second step is a little unusual. There are two tabs, one here, one here. You pull on them, and then... Now the hood is in this position, which is a little bit unusual, and you're kind of wondering what's next. Well, you don't pull it up like this. Instead, the hood in this car does one of these. And when it's raised, the front bit is so cool because of the cutouts for the headlights. It kind of looks like the Batman logo. Now, once you have the hood open, you can kind of see exactly why this whole front area is so long. It's because the vast bulk of the engine is behind the front axle here. And in fact, this is really a mid-engine car. One of the other interesting things I like under the hood are these giant warning labels that say battery and trunk, so you don't forget. You want to shut the hood? It's actually pretty simple. You just put it down back into this position, and then you remember from here. Boom. Now, since we're opening stuff, let's open up the fuel door. It opens up just like a normal fuel door, nothing weird there, but the interesting thing is that inside there's a little notice that reminds you to check your engine oil at every single fuel refill. You won't find that in a normal car. Now, keeping with the exterior of the SLR, one of the coolest design details about this car, I think, is the turn signals. Look how cool these things look. But the style of the turn signals isn't the most interesting part. The most interesting part comes when you change your angle a little bit, and you'll notice that from over here, you can't see them at all. They're designed to only be visible when you're looking at the car from a certain angle. Now, one of the most significant features of this car is the exhaust. It doesn't come out in the back like every other car. Instead, it comes out right behind the front wheel, right here, and right under the driver's window. I'm not sure if that's such a good idea. Another interesting thing about the exhaust is the burn hazard decal. Because the exhaust is located right here, everything in this part of the car is hot. And so there's a little decal right here by the driver's door warning you exactly what not to touch so you don't get burned. Now, in the back of this car, this isn't a spoiler. Instead, Mercedes calls it an air brake. And the way it works is rather interesting. When you slam on the brakes in this car, the air brake goes almost straight up to kind of screw with the aerodynamics and 
help you slow down a little faster. Now, maybe the most interesting thing about the air brake is that you can adjust it using a set of controls directly above the stereo controls, right within easy reach of the driver on the center console. Now, you can raise it and have it in up mode like it is right now, or you can move the lever a little bit and then it goes into this mode where it's flush with the trunk. Your third option is perhaps the most interesting. You can do test mode. You move the lever to test and then the air brake shoots up like it would under hard braking, but only for a second. Then it goes right back down just so you know that it's working. Now when you're going 60 miles an hour on the highway, the air brake automatically pops up 10 degrees just so that it's ready in case you want to brake really fast. Now, speaking of interesting interior controls, you'll notice that the window switches aren't in the center here, and they're not on the center console either. And they're also not located on the door panel. So where exactly are they? Well, they're actually located down by the door handle on the floor next to your seats. Push them and they roll up and down the windows, just like normal window switches. Now the other interesting control located down here by your legs is the seat control. Now Mercedes makes a wide variety of power seat controls and they all look about the same with various different buttons for different parts of the seat. But in the SLR, these seats are one piece carbon fiber racing seats. And so the seat control is actually just one button. You push it and pull it and move the seat forward and you can tilt it back or forward, but the seat moves as one whole unit. It's kind of a weird experience compared to a regular Mercedes. Now, since we're on the subject of interesting controls, move to the center of the SLR where there are quite a few of them. For example, look at the center control stack. You'll notice that you don't see the stereo controls. Where are they? Well, actually they're hidden under the giant SLR logo. Push it, it opens right up and then you can control the stereo. Now, speaking of the cool buttons in the center of this car, let's talk about the coolest one. That would be the engine start button. It's located on the top of the transmission lever, which is an unusual place. Now, a lot of Mercedes models at the time had the button there, but none of them had it quite as cool as this because it's located under this cool gated aluminum knob. You lift it up, then you push the engine start button like you're firing a missile in a fighter jet. Unfortunately, there is one little drawback to the engine start button, and that would be the fact that you can't just get in and push it. Instead, you have to get in, turn the key like you would in a normal car, then you can push the engine start button. It's a little strange. Another interesting interior feature, this car has no glove box, but it has ample other places to store items inside, some of which are hidden. For example, there's this tiny little storage pocket in the passenger footwell, and in the middle, there's this little compartment large enough for a decorative USB stick, or maybe two. Somewhere in that compartment is the world's smallest ashtray with room for approximately one total ash. But the biggest storage space is also the most hidden. To access it, press this little button located between the seats and then this whole panel lifts up. Nobody knows this is back here. I guarantee there are SLR owners watching this video right now going, really, it can do that? But the most interesting storage space in this car is not the rear shelf, but actually the piece between the seats. To access it, you push this little button, it folds down. Why is it the most interesting? Because it contains the original flip phone, a Motorola and Verizon car phone that came with every SLR. Hello? Yeah, I'm in my SLR. Yeah, I'm going 200. No big deal. Another interesting center control in this car, you get the air conditioning, you got the stereo, you got your vents, and also you have these things. Now, I already covered this one, that would be the spoiler, but these two rotary dials on either side require some explanation. The one on the left here, that's for the transmission. You can go to sport, manual, or comfort. Now, if you put it in manual, that's when the one on the right comes into play. You have three settings, one, two, and three. One is for sporty driving, two is for very sporty driving, and three is for racing-like driving. I haven't made these up. That's what it says in the owner's manual. Take a look. Another amazing quirk is the climate controls. Right now it's set to automatic, but what if you want to control where the air comes out? Push it and the button completely changes its appearance, now letting you select the location of the airflow. But, say you want it back in automatic mode, just push it again. Now it's in auto. Pretty cool. And now it's time to take this car out on the road. But before I do, I wanna share a little anecdote about the SLR that I find kind of interesting. A couple of months ago, I was invited out to Jay Leno's garage in Burbank to appear in an episode of his TV show for CNBC. Now, Jay Leno has one of these and he has it parked right next to his McLaren F1 and his McLaren P1. So I asked him, you know, Jay, what do you think about this car? He told me that he likes it and he thinks it's actually kind of misunderstood. Now, while the SLR came out at the same time as the Carrera GT and the Enzo, Jay told me that he thinks that those 
cars were more for high-speed track use, whereas this thing is rock solid above 200 miles an hour. Jay told me that the mistake people make is they think this car is gonna be an Enzo or a Carrera GT, when actually it has a completely different purpose. So now I'm gonna get behind the wheel and find out if he's right. All right. We're going on the SLR. The steering is just incredibly heavy. Very surprising because a lot of Mercedes in this era, the steering is very light and, and just airy. Low speed steering is just almost feel like we don't have power steering. And the other thing you notice right away is that you got a long hood in this vehicle. <laughs> There's a lot in front of you. Uh, if you look on the exterior of the car, you're basically sitting over the rear wheel. Something like 70% of this car is ahead of you as you drive down the street. That's something weird to get used to. Wait, it, it, the, my first impression, it has some rumble to it and some sound. I was really thinking this would be sort of the uh, comfortable exotic, but, but just instantly you can kind of tell. Eh. I'm really surprised by how hard the brake pedal is to push down. Part of it could be because the brakes are carbon ceramic, but part of it could just be the way this car is engineered. It's, it's interesting, it's unusual. So driving this car at normal speeds is a fairly reasonable experience. You don't really think anything crazy is going on, except it definitely rumbles even more than a regular AMG car. But otherwise, it seems like a fairly normal Mercedes-Benz experience in here, which is nice if you don't want to, you know, if I'm for the days where I'm not on the racetrack or trying to drive 200 on the Autobahn. Ride is harsh. The <laughs> ride, but you're in an exotic car. You're in a supercar. This is a real thing. One of the complaints about this car at the time was the transmission. Uh, the Enzo used as a new sequential manual. It's pretty new for the time. The Courage GT used a true manual. This car had a torque converter. And you can kind of see how that is a little bit more of a letdown than those two. The torque converter is just a little bit slower. And especially in the modern world where we're all used to dual clutches, uh, it's just not quite the same experience. Um, but, you know, as a technology hat, I mean, a sequential manual of that era, like in the Enzo, those are also feeling pretty outdated right about now. The only one that isn't is the stick shift, which is why all these manual cars have started to shoot up so much in the valley. I didn't like this car. I never really liked the steering wheel. It like, looks like a you know exotic car steering wheel should. And steering wheel is something you look at all the time. You know, it's something you're constantly seeing. The seat isn't the world's most comfortable seat. This carbon bucket seat that grabs you. It's not as bad as I've seen in some sports cars, 911 GT3 RS, that sort of thing. But it's it's a little bit harsh on you. You know, if I saw this car on the road, I would just freak out. Well, Enzo is one thing. Everybody kind of wants to see an Enzo. But this, if you're a car person, you see this, it's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was about a half throttle. That is pretty intense. This thing, this thing can haul. And the experience of it hauling is great. Modern cars are kind of are kind of cut off from the road. This one actually really rumbles. It's more of a muscle car than I expected it to be. I drive it. Whoa, that's crazy. And that's supercharged. You can hear the whine. That sounds so good. Wow. Yeah, this, so this car could pass just about any of it. I feel like it's kind of Superman in this car. I can change where we are and instantly, which is interesting because this car is not small. Uh, you know, you really think of a car that can kind of zip around like as a GT4, GT3 style car, uh, which this isn't. But it's so fast and the power comes on very quickly. Boy, I love that sound. It's, it's remarkably stable and composed just on a normal, everyday road here. The ride is harsher than a, a CLK or an E-Class or something like that when you go over bumps. But I could sit here for a while. I mean, I don't even find the seats to be that uncomfortable. It's just that they're not really all that adjustable. And they do kind of hug you. If you were a larger person, I think you'd have trouble in this car. I'm going to give it a little gas right here. It just felt like it was going to keep going. It's funny because this car is, what, 12 years old? It came out with 0304, something like that. So it's 12, 13 years old, the design is. And, but this thing could keep up with any modern car today. I actually think it is best to just let the car do the shifting itself. You start playing around with it and you try to be like a little sports car driver. That's not really the point of this car. This is a serious, uh, you know, put it on the highway and floor it and see what happens kind of car. When I'm accelerating hard in this car, it feels very stable. The, the faster you go, you don't start to feel nervous. Uh, this car feels like it has barely scratched the surface of what it can do. I mean, with half, I've never, I don't know that I've ever been in a car that accelerates so quickly at half throttle. 
it is a big car. You can feel that when you're turning it. And the other thing you can feel when you're turning and you kind of moving the wheel is, uh, you can feel all that weight in front of you. It is so fast, but there is a lot of front weight. And, uh, and it, the steering is good and the handling is pretty good, but there is a lot of front weight. And you really have to keep that in mind when you're making turns, especially high speed turns. It's just, a, it's, it's not that it's bad. It's just a different way of driving the car. The steering is very precise, but the handling is kind of affected by all that weight in front. But it isn't the sensation you would get in a mid-engine exotic car like this one's rivals, the Enzo and Crew GT. But you know, it's interesting, it, these comparisons to Crew GT and Enzo, just because they came out at the same time and they cost about the same, it's laughable. I mean, it's been a while since I've yeah. driven Crew GT, but it isn't even close. It's such a different car. That car really is. It felt like a big MR2 or 911 or Lotus Elise or whatever. Um, this thing feels like... I don't even know how to put it, like a, a Mustang, you know, because it has big front engine, tons of power. Uh, this is a muscle car. It's, it's a straight line car. It handles pretty well, but it's just got a lot of weight and a lot of... So that's the Mercedes McLaren SLR. You know, I've always kind of had a thing for this car. I mean, yeah, it's not as limited production as the Ferrari Enzo, and it doesn't have the Ferrari brand name, and it isn't the last analog supercar like the Porsche Carrera GT, but the SLR is cool in its own right. This thing is the forgotten $500,000 supercar that doesn't really deserve to be forgotten. There are two tabs, one here, one here. You pull on them, and then 